I'm not hearing any audio.
Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I can see from the angle of my um, camera, there was no need for me to put a tie on. So dear colleagues, can you hear me? I can hear you. 
Okay, okay. So it's uh, it's time for to for us to start our session. Well, dear guests, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Li Hu, Vice Chairman of China Commercial Maritime Arbitration Commission, the former Deputy Secretary General of China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission. I'm very happy to be appointed as the moderator of our session. Our session is about dispute resolution lines built and road. What are the options? In our session, we have four speakers, including myself. The speaker is Julia, Co Julia Cohen, the barrister from Jill Chambers, Hong Kong. Last week, Andrew Weir, the partner, Arnold, and the porter. And last week, is Takran, the director of PRG Consulting in Singapore. Uh, because after discussion among speakers, so in the session, the speaker's presentation will focus on dispute resolution related to one bed, one road initiatives over. So in the first place, uh, I want to uh, make my presentation then followed by our three, following the three speakers. After all of the speakers finish the presentations, we will invite questions from the floor according to the discussion and deliberation uh, uh, yesterday evening. So for the title of my presentation, my presentation, the title of my presentation is the main development of the China institutional arbitration under the One Bet, One Road initiative from the perspective of CMAP. In the first place, I want to, something, to say something about the main developments at CMAC that have been stimulated by Uber over the past few years. As you know, under the Uber initiative, in the Chinese mainland, the relevant policies, laws, and regulations have been issued and enacted to attract foreign investments and encourage Chinese companies and enterprises to Let's. We appear to be having some difficulty with the audio feed for Dr. Li Hu. Please give us a moment while we try to resolve that. One or more former arbitrators for the convenience of foreign parties. The arbitration rules were amended once again in 2018 to adopt the best practice of international arbitration and upsize the chance to manage.
stay. Hello. Um, as we're having technical difficulties, uh, we thought we would move on to the first of um, the speeches or the presentations, which is going to be mine. Um, can I just ask the panelists to, oh, okay, we, we've got the slides now. Firstly, my name is Julian Cohen. I'm a barrister and arbitrator based in Hong Kong. Much of my practice is related to Belt and Road disputes. Um, a lot of it is outgoing PRC work, so acting for Chinese contractors, but also sitting in disputes um, as an arbitrator uh, on around the region. What I wanted to talk about today in the sort of 10 to 15 minutes that we've got are firstly, what types of disputes do we tend to see? Um, and do we think we're going to see given the current changing landscape? Um, and if we could have the next slide, please. Typically, um, and, and we will get uh, to have the benefit of Anton Ware's um, significant experience and expertise in the area of investor state arbitrations shortly but typically when one's talking about BRI what you hear about is investor state arbitrations that tends to be the sort of sexy um, major topic but um, I have to say I think it misses something really rather important which is actually in terms of statistically and daily work investor state arbitrations are really just the sort of icing on the cake, a very, very interesting area, uh, very important, but an icing. The research that I have seen, which is borne out by my anecdotal evidence, um, is that probably 80, roughly 80, 85 percent of all disputes coming out of BRI and likely to come out of BRI are not investor state disputes or arbitrations they are com effectively commercial disputes and primarily construction and engineering disputes also some shareholders disputes some joint venture disputes uh, and, and some related types of issues but the biggest area of work possibly not the, the, the most interesting although it's the area i practice in and find it interesting but really the the big area are these commercial disputes um, and that, I think, is important, both for anyone who is involved in projects, because one mustn't forget the fact that actually you're much more likely to get involved into that, sucked into there, and the investor state is likely to be a call of last resort. Um, and secondly, for those of us who are trying to serve 
um, the industries and trying to, to assist in dispute resolution. I think it's quite clear on any view that the landscape of projects and disputes along BRI is changing substantially and in ways that we don't yet fully understand what the impacts are going to be. Right. Clearly, we've got going on at the moment COVID. We have a changing geopolitical landscape, both involving um, how the states and Europe interact with the world, but also how the, the PRC, which is of course the main sponsor of, of um, BRI, interacts with the, the region. And we have, as a result of COVID and other things, significant um, funding issues. Um, the, the world is therefore changing. I don't think, although I may be wrong, that the fundamental balance between commercial disputes and investor state disputes is going to be very substantially changed, although I suspect Anton will be getting busier because I think it's quite clear that some of these, particularly some of the geopolitical issues, may well end up in investor state type arbitration. I mean, it's clear, for example, that, uh, and I've had a number of queries, inquiries on the commercial dispute side, that the, the issues between India and China, for example, are leading um, projects to be um, cancelled, Chinese contractors asked to leave. And some of those may very well in, end up in investor state. But I suspect what we're going to see over the, the coming 12 months, and I say this with caution because if we'd been speaking six months ago, let alone 12 months ago, I would never have predicted the world looking anything like it is now, is increasing numbers of disputes, but most of those in a straight old fashioned um, commercial arbitration with um, some rather interesting work then going on to people like Anton. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, what I then wanted to do, having sort of set that as my, my general prediction, um, is um, to talk about some of the practical lessons I think we um, could look at. Uh, and I've divided really those into two categories. Um, old lessons reinforced, because I think a lot of the types of issues um, are, uh, and types of lessons that we're seeing now are simply the old lessons that we always talk about, which always need to be considered, but their importance coming back to us. Um, and then new aspects to consider. Um, I'm not sure whether we can, if we could flip to the next slide, that would be fantastic. Um, thank you, Robert. Um, in terms of old lessons reinforced, the next, the, the first bullet point I've got, which you can't yet see, is choice of law. What is quite clear, I mean, the choice of law is always going to be an important issue, always has been. There is a significant difference between how the civil and common law legal systems work, um, between the importance and the common law system of objective certainty um, and predictability versus uh, a greater emphasis on um, fairness and on, com uh, on matters like that from the civil law system. That's an area we, we can explore maybe in questions, but we're seeing it very clearly, of course, amongst COVID cases because common law has no concept really of force majeure apart from a contract, anything that's in the contract. Uh, and its nearest equivalent frustration really is in uncharted waters. We know that frustration comes about when there is a supervening event for which the risk is not allocated and which is through no, no fault of anyone else, um, which prevents performance. But typically, 
English law has been very slow to, to pick that up and to actually implement it. If, for example, one goes back to the Suez Canal crisis in the 50s and the cases coming out of that, what you tend to find was that the majority of cases where people started to argue frustration failed because, for example, they just said, um, deliver cargo from India to England, and that could still be done. And the fact that it had to go via the cable um, and would take a great deal of time to get there was not considered sufficient economic dislocation or temporal dislocation to bring about frustration. Where the contract said um, ship through the Suez Canal, and the Suez Canal was closed, then there was frustration. So we're going to have to, to wait to see how courts and tribunals under English type law deal with something like COVID. It may be that the scale and sadly the ongoing duration of these events are such as to put us into the frustration area. But you can see there very quickly how the choice of law ha has a big impact. Um, choice of language I think is often underestimated when we're talking about um, international arbitration, but the choice of language determined for the arbitration determines in part the nature of the tribunal we're going to get, and that in itself can have a big impact on how your contract is interpreted. Uh, for example, I sat in a big Macau arbitration where I was the only uh, non Macanese member, well, a person involved, I was on the tribunal one of three. Um, but we definitely um, approached matters in a slightly different way because we had a more international tribunal. But I was only appointed because English was the working language of the, of the tribunal. If it had been Macanese or Chinese, we, you, they would have probably ended up with an entirely local panel. That's not to say that's a bad thing, but that choice of language does have a significant impact on, on, the, na on, the, on who gets appointed and therefore um, how disputes are resolved, uh, and of course, um, what sort of dispute resolution you want and the style of tribunal are going to be important. Again, maybe issues we want to pick up in questions or to explore on another occasion, but I want, just before I finish, to, to talk about three or four new aspects to consider. Um, the first one, I'm going to take it out of order, is adapting common law contracts. Um, I think, for example, it follows that from what I've said about things like force majeure uh, and frustration, that people entering into contracts along the BRI with things like English law need to think about how are they going to specify method or are they going to now insert provisions for future projects that, that might give relief and remedies? How are we going in the future, not so much on the, the projects now, but how are we in the future going to allocate risk, for example, to things like pandemics? I, it's clear, unfortunately, I think, that, um, that the current pandemic is unlikely to be entirely resolved this year. Furthermore, even if we are successful in resolving it, there's going to be an uncertainty as to whether it will come back or something else will. And, and so there has to be, I think, moving forward uh, along BRI, particularly where you've got um, host countries, right, where the projects are, who are often short or, or, or financial resources as to how is risk going to actually be allocated. Um, and that also sort of ties into enforcement issues. Uh, you know, a number of places, including, for example, the PRC have, have implemented national schemes for how to deal with the COVID risk in most, um, whether a dispute's related to COVID or coming out of it. Um, how, will, uh, an, how will a tribunal that's, for example, sitting under English law, but where the, the award might be enforced in, in, say, China or somewhere else, take into account um, the the local approach to, to things like COVID risks in the place of enforcement, should they question mark. So I think that's an area where we, we need to see some 
in some, some thinking and we'll see some developments. Um, modern technology is, is important. Um, what I think has been interesting is that for those of my colleagues who are court bound, um, COVID seemed to bring about a, a complete, not only uh, stoppage of work, but a complete revolution in how lawyers have work have worked. Whereas for those in arbitration, yes, we've had to grapple with how do you deal with um, virtual substantive hearings. But for the most part, how we work uh, as lawyers involved in arbitration hasn't really changed because so much has been done already by email. Um, preliminary meetings, procedural just meetings, interlocutories have often been dealt with remotely. Um, but where we are going to be seeing, I suspect, a, a, a permanent change is modern technology. Um, that, I think, also impacts both on the style of arbitrator that you want and more in particularly the arbitration venue or center. Um, I suspect it will be a while yet before the, the world, it, people have enough confidence to be certain that their disputes will be resolved in person. We will, I suspect, for at least for the next 18 months, possibly permanently, be going more to to virtual hearings. Um, there's a lot that can be said about that again on another occasion. But the, the thought I'd leave you with on that topic is that therefore does mean that one needs to think about what institutes um, have good support for um, for virtual hearings. Um, those institutes that are, are setting up and are on go, are, are developing will need, I think, to, to um, invest heavily in technology. Um, but finally, and, and with no uh, competitive edge in relation to, to Thailand and to our hosts, I think it is important that I say that if you are not using Thailand as your seat, Hong Kong remains a very viable seat. Um, there is, of course, a great deal um, going on politically. Um, whatever view one takes, uh, one can understand if international businesses were concerned about what impact that might have on arbitration. Uh, I think one can safely say that whatever views one has of the geopolitical issues, whatever views one has about it, the impact on the way of life, Hong Kong as a dispute resolution centre um, is very much alive, very much still uh, rule of law and very much um, still attracting good high level pro professionals. Um, uh, and at the risk of, uh, uh, of saying something that perhaps shouldn't be said, um, it's certainly not the case that arbitrators here are pro-Chinese parties. I mean, there is very much the emphasis on, still on, on independence um, and you will get an impartial decision. If there's anything, there's a slight possible cynicism about the Chinese party, but the, even that is probably not the case. You really will get an independent result. But those are the, really the points that I would pick up. But in particular, I think as we start moving to a position where the, not the impact of COVID has changed, has stopped, but where the shock of the impact has started to ameliorate, we are going to need to think about how we deal with the disputes that arise, and I suspect we'll see more of them. Um, Anton, if we haven't got our chairman, I think you're next, aren't you? Thank you very much, uh, Julian. And uh, before I begin my presentation, I had uh, one question for you about, about your very interesting uh, comments. Uh, and I was curious in particular about the issue of choice of law, which you mentioned uh, a couple of times, both in connection with um, the, the, the choice of law question and also the adaptation of common law contracts to our changed circumstances. I was wondering, what have you seen historically 
in terms of the law that is uh, being chosen for outbound Chinese uh, cross-border investments? Uh, is, is one law predominating over others? Is it Chinese law, for example, or uh, English law or Hong Kong law? I know I've seen each of those in, uh, in some circumstances. And <clears throat> are you seeing any kind of changes over time in terms of the bargaining leverage between the Chinese party and the contracting party uh, in uh, the other jurisdiction uh, that could potentially be pointing to a trend uh, in a different direction in terms of the, the choice of uh, governing law? Interesting questions. I mean, I think the first one is for the, uh, my, my own experience is generally English law seems to be the most predominant. I'm not, I'm saying not to the exclusion of everything else. Um, occasionally, um, PRC law, um, sometimes um, other foreign laws. But, but I think we're still away from the world in which um, Chinese law is the the main governing law. It has happened, in fact, it, it, I dealt with one dispute uh, which where the project actually was in Thailand and where the governing law was, was mainland Chinese. In terms of trends away, I th my suspicion is, well, I sp the first thing is the world is changing so fast it's hard to have any certainty. Um, if you had asked me four or five months ago, I would have said, I suspect we will slowly over the next 10 to 15 years see more of a drift towards civilian type laws being used and tribunals being used. I think costs issues, if you look where the, the major investment is coming from or the areas where, for example, Middle East, North Africa, where, where you're likely to have big projects. Um, change of bargaining power I mean, I think at the moment it's fair to say at one level China probably has a bit more bargaining power. On the other hand, there is also a sort of countervailing, with it, whether right or wrong, and I make no comment on whether I think on whether I think this view is justified or not. There is also, I suspect, around the region an increasing countervailing concern about being too heavily reliant on on, on Chinese investment, and that may, I think, counteract that. So. If I had to guess, probably the same sort of um, choices of law for the next five years and then possibly evolving, but not sure what your views are. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful, yes. I, I tend to, to think of, of governing law as a function of uh, bargaining leverage, but I'm sure there are a number of other factors that uh, that go into it as well. And it's been interesting for me as well to see the kind of predominance of English law. Uh, and um, so it'd be interesting to see whether that changes uh, or not over over time. Uh, it, it, English law seems to have quite quite the staying power uh, over different time periods and across different uh, regions. Uh, I, I have seen Hong Kong law, you know, prior to the re recent events. Uh, I've seen a number of contracts uh, for Chinese outbound cross-border investment uh, that point to Hong Kong law, which it's possible that parties may be thinking that uh, that is in some way a hybrid or uh, neutral uh, choice of law as between, you know, there's some proximity to China, but you're still getting a common law choice of law. I'm not, I'm not sure whether that's necessarily a, an accurate or correct way for, for the parties to be thinking about that choice, but uh, that, that seems to be one of the, the uh, one element that is factoring in to the calculus. So um, perhaps I can ask if um, uh, Tigran or, or Dr. Li Hu, do either of you have any questions or comments on Julian's presentation before I begin my presentation? Okay, so hear, hearing, hearing none, I will then uh, go ahead and proceed and please uh, Let's see if the technology cooperates. I'm going to share my screen. Very good. So uh, my name again is Anton Ware. I'm a partner with the law firm of Arnold and Porter based in Shanghai, China. And uh, my practice is a mix of uh, commercial arbitration, which uh, Julian was just discussing, and 
uh, the topic of my presentation, which will be investment treaty arbitration or investor state uh, arbitration. Uh, and uh, for, the, for the record, I agree with Julian that uh, uh, although uh, there is much discussion of investor state uh, dispute uh, settlement, uh, in, in practice, the vast majority of disputes uh, are, do fall into the commercial category, into the commercial arbitration category. And I think we can explore some of the reasons why that may be the case in, uh, in my presentation. So there's uh, much more that can be said about the topic of uh, investor state arbitration and uh, Belt and Road Initiative disputes than can fit, be fit into a 12 to 15 minute uh, time period. I could probably speak for hours on this topic. I promise you I will, I will not do that. Uh, I'm going to do, uh, do my best uh, to, oh, it looks like I'm, I'm getting some assistance. What, was the sharing not working? Okay. Um, anyway, I will do my best to, 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 to move quickly. Uh, and if there are questions afterwards, we can address some of these issues in greater detail. So uh, the, what is the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, it is a, an initiative on, a, on an incredibly vast scale uh, to promote investment uh, in, 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 and regional economic and infrastructure cooperation across uh, a web of jurisdictions kind of emanating from uh, China, but connecting to uh, various jurisdictions in the region and around the world. Uh, the, the, the scale of it, you can get a bit of a sense from the infographic on the right side of this slide. It, uh, there are 143 countries that are now included in the initiative, accounting for roughly 70% of the world's population and 55% of global uh, GDP. Uh, to date, many of the key players uh, in actually making Belt and Road investments have been uh, large state-owned entities uh, in China. And there's a list of some of the players there on the slide. Uh, but we're also seeing an increasing number of investments by uh, private companies, private Chinese companies. And the Chinese government has uh, taken the position or announced that it expects that Chinese private firms will be uh, one of the driving forces of the Belt and Road Initiative going forward. Now, if we could go to the next slide, please. Now, uh, as is the case in any foreign direct investment, uh, the investor faces a number of political and uh, legal risks uh, when making an investment in a BRI jurisdiction. Uh, this is, there's many reasons for that. Uh, you're, you're often encountering a, a political system that may be different from the system that you're used to, a, a legal system that, uh, that may be different, uh, and an economic and market system that, that may be different as well. Uh, we, we noted that roughly half of the BRI countries, the 71 BRI countries, have economic freedom scores, which are below the world average. The economic freedom score is a kind of a hybrid rating that is a part of the, the country risk uh, metric. And it uh, looks at things like the development of the rule of law in that country and the openness of the market, the openness of the market to investment, to foreign investment, the openness of the labor market, et cetera. Uh, there are particularly for many of these large infrastructure projects, significant environmental health and social concerns arising in relation to the projects. Uh, and so it can be very important for the investor to uh, pay attention from the outset to uh, making connections with uh, local stakeholders and all stakeholders to make sure that uh, they don't face uh, significant uh, opposition along uh, these lines. Uh, and uh, as Julian mentioned, there is, uh, there is the risk of a certain degree of uh, pushback or backlash uh, to uh, uh, the perception of an over-reliance on Chinese uh, investment uh, among certain governments and, and, and in certain countries. And that's something that I think it's fair to say is 
on the increase in certain places around the world. And it's something that Chinese investors who are uh, venturing out on the Belt and Road uh, need to be aware of. Now, uh, investor state arbitration, what is it? It is uh, refers to direct claims by investors against sovereign states alleging violations of investment protections that are typically uh, included in an investment treaty. Uh, sometimes uh, you may also be talking about protections that were in a, a contract issued by the state or protections in a national investment law. But by and large, for the most part, we're talking about investment treaties. Uh, and these claims are administered through arbitration uh, outside of the national court system. Uh, typically through uh, ICSID, which is an arm of the World Bank in Washington, D.C., uh, or as an ad hoc arbitration, uh, often using the UNCTRAL rules. If we could go to the next slide, please. So on this slide, we've uh, listed examples of uh, prior investment treaty cases uh, involving Chinese investors in uh, BRI countries. Uh, there are uh, seven of those cases listed here. And what's, I should note uh, immediately that none of these cases, to our knowledge, actually involved a, um, a Belt and Road Initiative investment. I think most of the investments that were at issue in these cases all predated the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but these are examples of investment treaty disputes between a Chinese investor and a government in a host state in a Belt and Road uh, jurisdiction. And so they provide an interesting kind of roadmap uh, to how investment treaty uh, disputes arising out of Belt and Road investments could, could potentially be uh, resolved. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those cases in the course of the presentation. If we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, the, the, the first important feature to note about investment treaty arbitration is that it is not a mechanism of dispute resolution that is always available. It, it is only available in limited circumstances. And this may be one of the reasons why we don't see so many of these disputes, near, not nearly as many as we see commercial disputes. So before you can uh, bring an investment treaty arbitration, you have to have an applicable investment treaty that covers the investment uh, at issue. Uh, so the, if you're a Chinese investor investing in a Belt and Road jurisdiction and you uh, are thinking about making such an investment, one of the first questions you would want to ask is whether there is a treaty in place between China and the host state uh, where you'll be making the investment. And um, you then want to take a look at that treaty to confirm that it, in fact, would apply and would provide investment protections to your investment. So you're going to have to look at how the treaty defines the term investor and would you be covered by that definition? How does the treaty define uh, the word investment and would your investment be covered? And then, of course, critically, is the treaty already in force? Uh, sometimes treaties are signed, but for one reason or another, there can be a delay, sometimes an indefinite delay, before the treaty actually enters into force. Uh, and uh, if, it's not, if it hasn't entered into force, it's not going to provide those protections. So typically, uh, generally speaking, we're only Chinese nationals are going to be covered by China's investment treaties, uh, the, but sometimes the locally incorporated subsidiaries, so local companies in, uh, incorporated by the Chinese investor in the jurisdiction in which the investment is made may also be uh, covered. Whereas intermediary companies like special purpose vehicles incorporated in tax advantage jurisdictions are not going to be uh, covered and they would not be a proper claimant in one of these uh, cases. Uh, there is some uncertainty as to whether Hong Kong and Macau investors uh, are covered under China's investment treaties. There have been a couple of investment treaty arbitration cases that have grappled with that question. Uh, and in both of those cases, the, invest the tribunal ultimately held that uh, the Hong Kong or Macau investor uh, was covered, but the Chinese government itself has taken a different position that, uh, that um, uh, Macau and Hong Kong are not covered by 
China's investment treaties unless there's a special arrangement in place to extend that coverage. So there's some uncertainty there. So on this slide, uh, we focus in a little bit on the, the, the question of jurisdiction. So once you've determined that there is an investment treaty that applies, the next question is going to be whether that treaty includes a consent to investment treaty arbitration uh, that is broad enough to cover the scope of your dispute. And this is a particular issue for China's investment uh, treaty program because uh, China has one of the largest sets of investment treaties of any country in the world, uh, but it, the, the program has now been through several generations. The first generation of Chinese investment treaties uh, were entered into and came into force in the 1980s and early 1990s. And those first generation treaties included a very, very narrow consent to jurisdiction clause which meant that uh, even if you had various investor protections under the treaty, the investor was not permitted to bring an arbitration claim against the state, uh, except in relation to a very narrow category of claims relating to the amount of compensation for expropriation. Any other type of claim would be outside the scope. Uh, now, started beginning around 1998, uh, China changed its, its model investment treaty to uh, broaden, widen the scope of consent to jurisdiction, so that basically all disputes relating to an investment would be covered. So if you're, if you're looking at a China investment treaty, you've got to first take a look at that jurisdiction clause and find out, are you in the world of an, uh, a first generation or a modern generation bit? And we've listed on this slide the top 10 uh, recipients of BRI investments. And we note that each of those uh, countries does have an investment treaty with, uh, with China. So uh, yeah, yes, you can go ahead now to that next slide. Thank you. So on this slide, uh, we zoom in a little bit to that question of if you do have an, a first generation uh, investment uh, treaty, uh, is, it going, is the jurisdiction going to be broad enough to cover a claim for expropriation? And this is kind of an interesting, but perhaps somewhat esoteric uh, area. I'll, I'll, I'll try to cover it very, very briefly. But the basic idea is that these first generation treaties state that uh, only disputes concerning the amount of compensation for expropriation uh, are covered uh, by the consent to jurisdiction. Now, there have been five cases that, uh, where the tribunals have been asked to interpret that clause. And in three of those cases, the tribunal took a somewhat creative, broad, expansive interpretation of the clause to say that, well, if it's a dispute concerning the amount of compensation for expropriation, implicitly that should also include the question of whether there was an expropriation in the first place. And so in those three cases, the tribunal allowed the claim for expropriation to proceed uh, to the merits. Uh, on the other hand, in the other two cases, the tribunal took a more literal interpretation uh, of the scope of jurisdiction clause and said, no, we're sorry, we, can, we only have jurisdiction to decide a dispute about the amount of compensation. Whether there was an expropriation in the first place is outside uh, the scope. So effectively, the investor would not, in, in those cases, have the ability to bring any claim, even a claim for expropriation, uh, under those first generation treaties. So if you're a Chinese investor and you're stuck with a first generation treaty, there's significant uncertainty as to the scope of the claims that you'll be able to have heard in the case. Next slide, please. So what are some of the uh, pros and cons of investment treaty arbitration as a mechanism for resolving uh, Belt and Road disputes? Well, from the perspective of the state, uh, having that uh, mechanism available is uh, advantageous to the state's own investors when they go and make investments in the territory of the other contracting party. Um, and uh, it also it provides an encouragement to foreign investment. So it gives some, some degree of assurance to investors that if they make the investment and later there is a dispute, that they will have a neutral forum for the resolution of that dispute. And that 
leads to the question of, well, from the investor's perspective, if there is a choice between different mechanisms for resolving disputes, uh, what are the advantages of an investor's state arbitration? Uh, first and foremost, it's a neutral venue as compared to having to bring a claim against the state in the courts of that state, which is obviously not a desirable uh, forum in most circumstances if you're a foreign investor. Uh, the second is enforceability. There are very strong mechanisms for the enforcement of investment treaty uh, awards. Uh, for an UNCITRAL proceeding, it would be through the New York Convention and for an ICSID uh, proceeding, the award would be enforced through the ICSID Convention. So that's uh, a, a strong positive. Uh, and then there's the idea of settlement leverage, uh, which is to say that states do take the threat of investment treaty arbitration quite seriously. And um, often, particularly at the very outset, when a, a claim is threatened or, or noticed, uh, often will be very receptive to, to potentially uh, settling such a claim to uh, avoid any reputational impacts, for example, uh, that might arise from having an investment uh, dispute. I've listed uh, some of the downsides there is the, the limited availability, which we've discussed um, already. Time and cost, these can be very uh, lengthy and expensive proceedings. Uh, uh, there is the, the risk potentially, theoretically, of uh, uh, steps by the state that could be seen or alleged to be retaliation against the investor. That's something that many investors will take into account. Um, now, if we could go to the next slide, uh, there's one final potential disadvantage from the perspective of the Chinese investor, which is that um, if the host state does not voluntarily comply with, a favorable, with an award that's favorable to the investor, the investor will need to go and try to enforce that award in another jurisdiction. Now for a Chinese investor, one would think the natural and logical place to, to wanna do that would be in, in China, in the courts of China, where you would go after any commercial assets of the state that might be present in China. The problem is uh, that that's virtually impossible for a number of reasons. Uh, don't have time to go into them in any detail, but China adheres to a doctrine of absolute sovereign immunity, which makes it impossible to, um, uh, to bring any suit against a, a sovereign state uh, in the courts of, uh, of China. Uh, China has also implemented a um, commercial declaration to, to, to the New York Convention, which um, it has interpreted to mean that investor state disputes are outside the scope of the New York Convention. And China also, although it is a party to the ICSID Convention, has not yet implemented uh, implementing legislation to the ICSID Convention in China. So those are some unique obstacles. If we could go to the last slide, please. Uh, last slide, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, you, uh, there we go. Uh, so on this last slide, I've listed some of the trends and hot topics in investment treaty arbitration. Uh, obviously, each one of these issues could uh, be the subject of a lengthy discussion. We would, don't have time to get into them. Now, uh, I would mention in the first one that although historically, almost all of these arbitrations have been either through ICSID or through the UNCITRAL rules, uh, there are now additional options available, which are particularly relevant in the um, uh, BRI jurisdictions. Uh, CTAC uh, uh, issued investment arbitration rules in 2017. The ICC issued uh, investment arbitration rules in 2017, and the Beijing Arbitration Commission did so in 2019. So, um, so we, we will start, we have begun to see and will continue to see some treaties giving investors the option of choosing one of these rule sets uh, or of choosing any rule set that can be agreed uh, between the party. Uh, there's obviously a uh, kind of raging debate around the world right now on, uh, in, on the subject of ISDS reform, which is largely uh, the, the main center of that has been the UNCITRAL Working Group 3. Uh, that's a fascinating uh, topic and one that we'll all watch closely, but outside the scope of this presentation. So I'll go ahead and uh, end there. Thank you very much. Anton, thank you. I, I, 
personally, I, I found that fascinating and a really excellent um, overview. I had just one question I wanted to ask you, um, which is one often hears about that difficult question area of when is an investor, well, sorry, when is a dispute, which probably starts off as a commercial dispute, when can a party elevate that to an investor state type dispute? In other words, where's that boundary between commercial and investment? And to what extent um, should project, at the project level, should, be, should people be looking at whether to elevate it to an investment state arbitration as opposed to a commercial arbitration? That's a great that's a great question and one uh, one that we've had the opportunity to uh, provide advice to clients on. It, you know, there is a legal answer and then there is a kind of strategic or tactical answer. At, at the at the legal level, uh, the question question would be whether there you have potential investment treaty claims that are viable, and that would uh, require making sure that you have. An investment treaty that is uh, that applies and that provides protections to this investment, and then you would need to be able to point to uh, conduct, acts, or measures that are attributable to the state itself um, that could form the basis for uh, a claim that one of those investment protections has been violated. And of course, you want to make sure that you satisfy all the other jurisdictional requirements under the. The treaty and if it's ICSID under the ICSID convention as well. So from that legal perspective, I think one of the, the most significant kind of dividing line is really this question of whether there was state conduct uh, or whether the conduct was really that of a commercial party that's not attributable to the state. That's probably the primary dividing line. Uh, on the kind of strategic and tactical level, you can think of investment treaty arbitration as another uh, uh, a quiver in the in the bow uh, for um, the investor and whether they whether they want to you know pull that trigger whether they want to use that weapon or not may depend on a number of factors including the extent to which they uh, want to continue to do business and preserve their relationship with the host state government uh, or, or whether that relationship has already deteriorated beyond uh, the point of uh, repair and uh, investor state arbitrations can be quite contentious and um, for that reason you know there is some risk to the investor that attaches to kind of going down that path so those are some of the strategic and tactical uh, questions that may arise I would also note that there isn't a there isn't always a clear dividing line in the sense that we often see cases that have parallel commercial and investment treaty arbitrations running together in parallel, um, re sometimes relating to the same uh, set of, of facts, uh, with the only difference being that the, the commercial claims arise or are framed as causes of action under the contract, whereas the investment treaty claims are framed as claims under the, uh, under the treaty. And the, the respondent is probably different as well. So probably a claim, you know, it would be a claim against the state in the investment treaty arbitration context, whereas in the commercial arbitration context, more likely to be uh, a claim against particular, for example, a particular government agency uh, or state-owned entity that um, uh, co contracted with the investor. So I hope that gives you some, uh, some answer to your question. That, that, yeah, that's really helpful. Um, who, who are we moving on to next, Anton? Can you remember? Uh, yes, so we should be moving on to Tigran next, unless there are any other questions or comments. So why don't we go ahead and, and do that now. Thank you, thank you Anton. Um, thank you, everyone. And, uh, so, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, so um, my name is Tigran Termatiresan. I'm a radiation and damages expert based in the Singapore office of BRG and focusing primarily on expert witness assignments and arbitration and litigation measures in the Asia Pacific region. So my fellow panelists uh, have already covered the legal aspects of various um, dispute resolution options for the BRI uh, related disputes. 
and I will try and focus more on the role of expert evidence in such disputes and um, any implications of the various mechanisms on the use of experts. Uh, so can I have the next slide, please? Uh, on this slide, really a brief overview of the BRI uh, itself, which Anton have touched upon already. So basically many countries participating in the initiative, uh, which provides for six economic corridors both by land and sea and connecting all major parts of uh, Eurasia. In terms of amounts at stake, uh, trillions of investments are planned uh, with the primary focus being on the infrastructure development. And in terms of the integration scope, it really covers uh, uh, many countries from APAC to EMEA region, which in turn implies a combination of one, uh, developed and emerging market economies uh, of wide ranging scale. The next point is that uh, those economies have a different stage of development of regulatory framework. And then lastly is that, you know, it combines various laws, meaning, you know, common and civil law jurisdictions, political systems and cultures. So in summary, all of that suggests that BRI disputes are likely to be multi-jurisdictional and, and quite complex. Uh, next slide, please. So as to the key sectors involved, uh, as the aim of the BRI is to improve connectivity in the region in terms of trade and movement of people, the main investments are expected obviously into construction of those infrastructure projects. And the main sectors are going to be uh, energy and utilities, for example, conventional and renewable power plants, gas pipelines, etc., and transport and telecommunication projects. So what is common between those industries is that projects tend to be long-term, both in terms of construction time and operating life, uh, measured typically in like 10, 20, 30 years uh, timeline. They tend to serve wider population. They all tend to be quite capital intensive and so involve large sums of equity, debt or public financing in them. And then lastly, they are all cross-border in nature, which again increases the complexity of related disputes. Uh, next slide, please. So to understand why and when BRI disputes may arise, and therefore why expert evidence may be required, let's look at the typical infrastructure project timeline and key associated risks. So first of all, what are the factors affecting the viability of the project in the greenfield stage? Well, first of all, it's availability in terms of financing, be it equity, debt, or project financing. This is where one may see disputes either due to a inability to raise finance or finance being raised on non-market terms. Or another option is to see disputes around valuations at which equity investors buy shares in the project. If we're talking about energy and utilities projects, offtake agreements are always critical um, and you know, can significantly affect the value of the underlying project. And in certain cases, may be a determining factor as to whether the project has any value at all or not. On the other hand, offtake is often concentrated in a single provider, so there is a higher credit risk exposure uh, compared to a diversified customer base. As to the regulatory side, one has to consider whether all regulatory approvals have been received. If not, what is the prospect and timing of receiving those? Does any particular government support um, framework apply to the project? Uh, and you know, if, tax, if it's tax subsidies, licensing, uh, land acquisition, or any guarantees to lenders? If so, does this framework apply indefinitely? Or if not, what is the risk of it being changed and when? Uh, if the government provides any guarantees or financing subsidies, does it mean the government will have a role in managing the project? And if so, will this potentially lead to any inefficiencies at a later stage? Um, if the project successfully moves to construction phase, what are the risks there? Well, there are plenty. Uh, so one is variations, you know, if any variations to the project are required by the owner. Question is how those are priced and what are the implications on the overall uh, completion schedule of the project? 
the project can also be delayed either due to owners or contractors fault or other factors like COVID, for example. Uh, CAPEX overruns are also quite common and might have a substantial impact on the value. Engineering construction defect issues may also cause delays and disruption. And if there is a delay or substantial CAPEX overrun, the question is, well, if there is a, an additional source of financing to close the gap and complete the project. But let's assume the project successfully, is successfully completed and starts operating. So what situations might lead to disputes in that stage? Um, again, you know, various things like supply chain disruptions, uh, questions around pricing of long-term contracts. So if we are talking about a power plant, for example, this can concern both uh, input fuel pricing as well as uh, output electricity tariffs. Uh, in regulated industries, again, the applicable framework may affect the value quite substantially. So for example, we've seen uh, plenty of disputes in the solar uh, power sector in Spain in recent years due to changing feeding tariffs. So similar situations might apply to power projects in the BRI. Uh, the returns, um, the question is, well, is the project meeting the expected return of the private equity sponsor, for example? And if not, you know, what are the implications for the project operator, the government and any other stakeholders? Uh, one can also observe all sort of M&A disputes if the project or part of the project is sold at any point in time. Projects can also be affected by things like force majeure, as a result of which uh, investors can claim business interruption losses from insurance companies potentially. And the worst case scenario, if the project is in financial distress, then its debt may need to be restructured, for example, via debt to equity swaps, or in worst case scenario, it may enter into an insolvency process. So there are all sorts of risks in the infrastructure project space which may require uh, expert evidence in your dispute. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, on this slide, I set out some examples of where expert evidence may be required in BRI disputes. Uh, obviously, all sort of delay, disruption, and productivity and engineering expertise may be needed uh, in the construction related dispute. Uh, if we are talking about gas supply projects, uh, there's always a question of uh, gas pricing, especially in long-term contracts, uh, which are typically subject to periodic price reviews or price revision uh, trigger causes. Power plants, um, again, if we're talking, for example, about a failed project, an expert might be asked to opine on, um, sorry, can I go back? Um, opine on, you know, whether best efforts were made to raise project financing for that. Fuel pricing, uh, power purchase agreement price reviews or take or pay provisions, uh, impact of regulatory framework changes um, on electricity tariffs and profitability. Uh, telecoms is another sector where, um, which may be subject to a host of uh, intellectual property related disputes in relation to licensing, be it renewal or termination, sale of IP, um, determining a reasonable royalty, or IP infringement matters. And then irrespective, almost irrespective of the industry, uh, you might need experts to opine on the governing law of the contract that was breached. Uh, M&A capital market experts may be required if you are disputing a transaction in the capital of the project, uh, or for example, a failed uh, APO allegation fraud investigation as a trace in, in case of uh, profit siphoning or mismanagement allegations. Valuation and damages experts are frequently appointed because ultimately many disputes um, are subject to an award for damages, uh, be it you know, in the form of the value of the shares in the business or lost profit assessments. And then restructuring and solvency experts are needed if, um, if we're talking about a financial distress situation. Next slide, please. So now that we know where, when uh, and where disputes might arise, so the next question is, well, where to look for expertise required? So the key factors to consider in selecting an expert is the knowledge of the subject matter, 
the market or the jurisdiction in which the project is located and potentially language. And the balance between those factors really depends on the nature of the case itself. So moving on, so if the dispute is to be resolved in courts, I think the first question is really whether it's a domestic court in the local jurisdiction or it's an international court, for example, like Sing uh, Singapore International Commercial Court or um, a similar court in Kazakhstan or Dubai, for example. And the reason for that distinction is that domestic courts may sometimes in certain jurisdictions only allow appointing experts from an approved list and or require experts to possess certain formal qualifications in that particular jurisdiction, which clearly may limit the universe of experts you can uh, potentially appoint. Uh, in contrast to that, international courts tend to be closer to a hybrid between court and arbitration proceeding and so might be a bit more flexible. Obviously, arbitration is, uh, you know, tends to be very flexible in terms of who can be appointed as expert. Uh, but even then, you have to consider whether arbitration is institutional or ad hoc, what are the respective processes for expert appointment in both. Uh, whether it's an investment or commercial arbitration, uh, which Julian and Anton have covered already. Uh, one, one issue that is relevant for investment arbitration is that uh, in some instances, um, if you are looking for an expert in the, in the subject state, uh, many experts might not be willing to act against uh, the local government. And so even if you need someone with plenty of market knowledge, you might not be able to find one um, in the local jurisdiction. So that's something to bear in mind as well. Uh, and then the last point is whether experts are appointed by the parties, tribunal or a combination of both. And this largely depends on the background of the parties, council and the tribunal. As you know, civil law background parties may be more sympathetic to the idea of having one tribunal appointed expert compared to those with common law background. Uh, yeah, and if the dispute has not yet reached a stage of litigation or arbitration, for example, they are in the mediation stage, the parties may, might be even more flexible in terms of uh, how experts can be uh, appointed. Uh, I mean, ultimately, uh, depending on the nature of expertise required, one can choose between foreign and local experts or a panel of experts if one exists in the court proceeding. And the balance has to be found between knowledge and experience in the subject matter, for example, damages assessment, industry knowledge, uh, so for example, in the power plant sector, market knowledge, meaning not just in the power sector, but the power sector in Thailand, for example, um, experience in litigation proceedings, like giving written and oral evidence, and court costs, being fees and logistics. Uh, last point to touch upon is language, uh, which may be an important factor, and this can be twofold. So one is the expert may need to look at the documents that are prepared in the native language of a particular jurisdiction, for example, like Chinese or uh, Thai. On the other hand, the same expert may also need to testify in, in English, if it's an international arbitration, or in local language, if it's a domestic court proceeding. So for example, my understanding is that in Thai courts, there is no strict requirement for experts to speak Thai, but in practice, it's very rare to see a non-Thai speaking expert in the courts there. Uh, next slide, please. So on this final slide, uh, I want to briefly talk about the different roles experts can take in arbitration and litigation procedures. Uh, so generally, there are three ways an expert can be engaged. So one is an advisory capacity, where basically an expert advises the party, sometimes behind the scenes, and is not necessarily bound by independence requirements of an expert witness. And the second role is an expert determiner, which is basically an independent expert who the parties jointly appoint to determine a particular issue. So for example, the value of the shares in a business or a project. In that scenario, typically expert determiners decision is final and binding upon the parties. And the final one is an expert witness, which is again, an independent expert whose duty is to assist the court or tribunal and not to advocate the position of, of the client. Uh, so let's briefly look at how uh, those expert roles change 
depending on the mechanism for the dispute resolution. Essentially, there is no limit as to um, expert's appointment as an advisor, because in that role, he can be appointed basically in each and every stage set out on this slide. If the dispute concerns a single discrete issue, for example, value of the project, the parties might decide to go under the expert determination route and appoint a, a joint expert. Uh, again, there is no limit for the parties to then have their own legal advisors on each side. Uh, and, you know, subject to the legal implications, which I guess may vary between the BRI jurisdictions, the outcome of the de determination is final and binding upon the parties. Uh, and mediation is pretty flexible in terms of, um, you know, how expert can be appointed. Experts can even participate in the mediation itself to try and narrow down, um, you know, the quantum, for example, if we're talking about damages. Um, adjudication, as I understand, and my colleagues uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, is more typically used in construction disputes. Uh, but the expert's role is really limited to a behind the scenes role in those, um, in, in that mechanism. So there's really no such thing as expert evidence existing in it. And finally, um, if parties reach a stage of arbitration or litigation, that is where independent expert evidence uh, comes into play. Uh, and, you know, independence objectivity requirements for an expert are also relevant. Ultimately, the outcome of litigation or arbitration brings more certainty in terms of the finality of the process and the enforceability of any award made. But at the same time, you know, on balance, uh, it tends to be more time consuming and costly from an expert's cost perspective compared to say mediation or expert determination mechanism. And therefore, um, in selecting the dispute resolution mechanism for the BRI dispute, when parties really have to find the balance between time costs and the, you know, the finality of the process. Um, I'm mindful of time, so I think that's everything I wanted to share today. Uh, I'm look, looking forward to questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tigran. And uh, I now would like to, to, to ask whether any of uh, the co-panelists have uh, questions or comments. Uh, on Tigran's presentation. For my part, I would just mention that it, it's a very rare case uh, that does not involve uh, an important role for experts, particularly technical experts. Uh, their, their testimony can be critical and their assistance throughout earlier phases of the case in helping the lawyers understand the, uh, the issues. Uh, can also be uh, absolutely essential. So I, I um, echo those comments from uh, from Tigran. Julian, um, I suppose I have. I mean, one I would echo what you, you've just said, Anton. But I suppose the question I would ask is this: traditionally and in practice, there has been a vast difference between how the common law type jurisdictions and the civilian type jurisdictions um, embrace and engage with experts. Common law experts, much more based on the idea of each party having their own and independent. Um, civilian generally, uh, much more of a tribunal appointed or court appointed uh, expert. Uh, and I suppose the question I have is this, against that background and against the background of the increasing, if I say corporatization of experts, of large firms, of consultants who give expert evidence. How, Tigran, do you see the world of expert evidence in the BRI regions uh, developing over the next few years? Yes, that's a, yeah, thanks, Julian. That's a good question. Uh, I think the question of, uh, you know, party appointed experts versus tribunal appointed experts, uh, you know, has been there for a while now, uh, particularly given that, um, uh, you know, uh, I think the, uh, the so-called Prague rules have been issued uh, a year or so ago. Um, and 
but, but my, my feeling is that still uh, in many, at least arbitration proceedings, uh, even if the parties and tribunal are primarily from civil law background, it is still more the case of uh, party appointing experts being, you know, engaged. Um, because I think, I think ultimately the key, uh, the key for the tribunal appointed expert is to, uh, you know, reduce the cost of the proceeding by having just one person compared to two. Uh, but, but ultimately, I think, uh, or there is a question whether, you know, if there is a tribunal appointed expert, um, a question is, well, will the parties still appoint their own experts on each side or, or advisors? Um, and then would one end up in the situation of you having three experts in the process as opposed to one, or, or as compared to two even. Um, so, I mean, I think the, the only way to, um, uh, you know, to kind of reduce costs here is whether, you know, when drafting an arbitration clause in the BRI uh, contract, people would stipulate basically the law and the rules for you know, appointing experts. So it, I think it's only if the parties explicitly agree to have a, a single joint expert or tribunal appointing expert, uh, this process can can work uh, because otherwise, uh, well, it is just my experience that tribunal appointed experts are a rare uh, phenomenon. Uh, although I've myself been just recently appointed in an LCA arbitration um, by the tribunal, but, um, you know, I think still generally it's a very rare thing to, to see. Thank you. That, that was really helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, so I believe we uh, have now been rejoined by uh, Dr. Li Hu in Beijing, and uh, I'm, hopefully the internet connection will be working better uh, this time. So, um, Dr. Li Hu, can we invite you to give your presentation now? So unfortunately, it seems that uh, we're still having technical difficulty. There's a message saying that uh, there's a low bandwidth uh, for uh, Yihu's connection. So we'll give it just one more moment to see if we can get that to work. And if, it, if not, I think I suggest we would go ahead and begin to answer some of the uh, questions that have been posed by the audience members. It looks like uh, Lihu has, has disconnected, is probably trying to reconnect. So in the meantime, why don't, why don't I go ahead, since I see that there were two questions uh, posed in relation to my presentation, why don't I go ahead and take a moment to uh, take a stab at answering those questions. And uh, we'll see then if, uh, if Lihu is able to successfully reconnect. So the, the first question that I received asked, uh, was asking about the cases in which the tribunals uh, reached a, 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 gave a broad interpretation to the scope of jurisdiction clause in the first generation Chinese bits. And the question asked whether when that happened, didn't it leave room open for a challenge of the award for exceeding the mandate? And that's a very interesting question. So the, uh, in the first such case, the Shum versus Peru case, there was a, uh, a challenge to the award uh, through, that was an ICSID proceeding. So the only, the only possible uh, challenge available uh, to the uh, 
to a, to an ICSID final award is through uh, an, the procedures that are available under the ICSID convention. One of those procedures is called an annulment proceeding. It is in some ways the equivalent of a set aside proceeding that uh, you would find in most national court uh, jurisdictions, but it has its own unique features, its own standards, and it, it generally speaking provides a very limited, very narrow scope of review of the final award in, uh, in an ICSID case. And so there was an annulment proceeding uh, brought against that award and that annulment challenge failed. Uh, so uh, in that case, the uh, tribunal's decision was uh, withstood uh, a, an annulment challenge. Uh, then there was the Sanum Investment versus Lau case. And that case uh, was so, has such a tortured procedural history. There were so many twists and turns. We could spend a lot of time uh, talking about it. But it's interesting to note that this was an Uncitral uh, case or a PCA case. So this was not an exit case. So that means that there was a, a seat of arbitration. The seat of arbitration was Singapore. And the final award was subject to set aside proceedings in Singapore. Uh, the, the decisions of the three different levels of courts in Singapore were all going in different directions. So this is a very tortured uh, history, very interesting kind of case study. But the, uh, and at the end of the day, to skip to the end of the story, at the end of the day, the, um, the highest court in Singapore ultimately um, uh, upheld uh, the uh, jurisdictional decision, uh, upheld jurisdiction, upheld that there was arbitral or found that there was arbitral jurisdiction. Um, but the, the, interestingly, I think the primary question that the court was focused on and that the arbitrators had been focused on was not the scope of the arbitration clause, but rather the, uh, the question of whether um, uh, these investors from Macau were covered by the Chinese uh, bit. That was the primary question. Uh, so I don't think we got much in the way of elucidation in terms of the the uh, secondary question of how to interpret that clause. And then finally, the third case where an abroad interpretation was adopted was the Yemen, uh, Beijing urban construction versus Yemen. That was an exit case and that case settled uh, before there were any uh, annulment proceedings. So that's the answer to your question. Potentially it could give rise to, an, to a set aside or annulment challenge, but none has yet been successful. Uh, the second question that I received uh, related to the question of sovereign immunity, and I'm thankful for the question because I was running out of time and wasn't able to really give that question adequate uh, coverage. But the question was whether a sovereign immunity waiver clause would be illegal and unenforceable under Chinese law. Uh, and uh, that, that question, to my knowledge and understanding, is unresolved. So we, we've looked and we have been unable to find any reported decisions uh, by Chinese courts addressing whether a sovereign express waiver of sovereign immunity uh, would be enforceable under Chinese law in, in Chinese court. Uh, that, so it's an open question. I think it still makes sense for investors to include an express waiver of sovereign immunity in their investment contract if they can bargain for it. Uh, but it remains an open question as to whether that would be enforceable in Chinese court. We do know from the FG Hemisphere case that uh, the Hong Kong courts have taken the position that in Hong Kong, uh, such a pre-dispute uh, waiver of sovereign immunity would not be, uh, is not enforceable uh, because in order to have an effective waiver of sovereign immunity uh, under the, at least under the Hong Kong common law position, uh, the the sovereign would have to make that waiver expressly to the Hong Kong courts after the dispute has arisen. Uh, so that gives a sense that at least in, uh, in, in Hong Kong, uh, those, those waivers may, are, are not uh, enforceable. In, in China, it remains uh, an open question. So I hope that answers both of those questions. I see that uh, Dr. Li Hu has now rejoined us again. So Li Hu, let me turn, tr try to turn it over to you again for your uh, much anticipated presentation. We'll hope, uh, hope for the best with the internet connection, but please uh, proceed if, if you can. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I will proceed with my presentation. So hopefully I 
I uh, hope this time the work is working well. So I've introduced to you the main developments of the China Institution of Arbitration and the One Bet, One Road initiative, especially from the perspective of China Maritime Arbitration Commission. So how about the main developments at CMAC that have been stimulated by over over the past few years. So under the one bet, one rose initiative over. So in Chinese mainland, you know, the relevant policies, laws and regulations have been issued. And enacted to attract foreign investments and encourage Chinese companies and enterprises to make overseas investments and trade. The first disputes arising from those contracts concluded after it's made in China. It's not always be the case that the parties will agree on um, after seat of the Chinese mainland. It is likely that the parties choose the third and neutral seat. In the past few years, the relevant efforts have been undertaken to promote the Ch China institutional arbitration under framework of the Uber initiative. In the first place, so in the first place, we are widely strengthening cooperation with international national ADR institutions and have signed cooperation agreements with arbitration centers, international organizations, actively exploring and promoting to establish bilateral and multilateral disputes resolution platform by which you know the listed institutions may promote together while providing their ADR services respectively if and when chosen by the parties. In the meantime, our panel arbitrators were updated in 2017 to include more and more former arbitrators for the convenience of parties to make their nomination in specific cases in arbitration China. So the Institute of Arbitration Rules of CMAC were also amended once again in 2018 to adopt the practice, best practice of international arbitration. For example, the emergency arbitrator, the single arbitration under multiple contracts and the joiner of the additional parties. And also, you know, for CMAC, we have created the CMAC Hong Kong Arbitration Center in 2015, in 2014, to, you know, meet the special needs of the parties of those contracts concluded outside, outside Chinese mainland. All of these measures in return gave a push for CMAC's further internationalization. As you know, in order to formulate a flexible ADR mechanism and better serve the Uber initiative. The Supreme People's Court of the Pure China, SVC, has established two Chinese International Commercial Courts, CICC, in Shenzhen and Guangdong province and the Xi'an of Shanxi province, respectively. And one International Council for Commercial Exports, SCCE, According to CSAC rules of procedure, which has come into force since 5th December 2018, SPC has included CMAC in the SPC's panel of arbitration and conciliation institutions so that for the relevant international arbitration conducted by CMAC, the parties may enjoy direct support from the SPC for reviewing jurisdiction writing interim measures and setting aside enforcing our word. This will both demonstrate and enhance CMAX credibility among one bet, one road countries. According to CMAX constitution, 
our panel of arbitrators should be updated once again before the end of the year 2020. We are also considering to initiate in time the revision process of the CMAP rules to respond to the latest developments in the past years and to meet demands by the parties from the future. So my cover is about the constant and static world in our international case. So the second point I want to report to you, my thought on the priorities preferred international arbitral seat in the next decade. Under the OVER initiative, the foreign related arbitration in China has been developing rapidly in recent years. As far as CMAC CTAC arbitration is concerned, the international case of the two institutions last year is 658 totally, while among these international cases, the former parties are from 93 countries' regions. So the data has demonstrated more and more confidence of foreign parties on Chinese arbitration, especially CMAC-CTEC arbitration. In my mind, in the next decade, the Chinese media is undoubtedly one of the preferred international arbitral seats taking further into consideration that the foreign institutions are allowed to provide arbitration services in the Chinese mainland. On the other hand, the OBER has benefited international arbitration, which proves that quite few regional or international institutions in Asia and Europe have accepted more and more China-related disputes in the past year. To my best knowledge, besides the Chinese mainland, the Chinese parties have preference or are likely to choose Hong Kong, SAR, Singapore, Paris, Stockholm, and London as a seat of arbitration. On the, flip slide, on the flip slide, the choice of the parties may be more diversified in the future. For example, on the side choosing CMAC arbitration with a seat outside the Chinese mainland, the parties may direct appoint CMA Hong Kong for arbitration with seat within or outside Hong Kong as they are. They will also agree with foreign institutions arbitrating in the Chinese mainland. Of course, the parties may choose all the places they may they think appropriate as seat of arbitration. So for promoting the popularity of the Chinese mainland as international arbitral seat, besides efforts to challenge arbitration institutions, the national arbitration legislation and the friendly judicial environment are always playing an important role. So in my mind, compared with unsafe model law and the Euro practice of international commercial arbitration, there are also big room for improvement on challenge arbitration. So the last Point I want to see some tips for arbitration lawyers. For the arbitration service, China has been and will continue to be a big market on the over initiative. The going out of China and the process needs the transnational assistance from the international lawyer, both in drafting legal documents and in resolving disputes. So the former arbitration lawyers can benefit from knowing more on, about the Chinese culture, which is a gateway to understand China and Chinese people. I know that for the big international arbitrations, the Chinese party is likely to have lawyers from at least one Chinese law firm and one international offshore law firm to jointly serve as a legal counsel. It is common for the Chinese legal professionals to be appointed as expert witnesses. It's helpful for the former lawyer to strengthen friendly cooperation with Chinese lawyers and the Chinese arbitration community. So it is also necessary for the former lawyers to know more about CMAC CTAC arbitration. In my capacity vice chairman of CMAC, I sincerely welcome more and more international arbitration lawyers to participate in CMAC arbitration as a legal counsel or arbitration in the future. So that's my presentation.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vihu. That presentation was well worth the wait, and we're happy that uh, ultimately we were able to resolve the technological difficulties. Uh, I had one question for you in, in relation to your comments about uh, mainland China as a um, increasingly preferred seat for arbitration in coming years. And I think you, you mentioned the, uh, the national arbitration law in China and how that there is some, uh, some gap between that law, which is a fairly old law, and uh, the Ancestral model law or other kind of more modern uh, arbitration, national arbitration laws that we see in other jurisdictions. Uh, is there uh, a movement uh, afoot in China to uh, reform the arbitration law? Is that something that you think we can expect to see in uh, the coming years? Yes, I think so. You know, the revision of national arbitration law is a hot topic in mainland China. As I know, uh, uh, more and more proposal have been uh, reported to the authorities for consideration. And, you know, uh, the following points will be addressed, particularly in amending the national arbitration law. The first is the competent competence theory. You know, under Chinese law, it's not the tribunal, but the institution that decides to take an issue. So it is suggested that the power should be vested to the tribunal. The second is now the second issue is about ad hoc arbitration in China. So it's much the concern is about whether or not ad hoc arbitration will be allowed in the future in mainland China. Another issue is that more freedom should be vested to tribunal in conducting arbitral proceedings. And also, you know, uh, some enforcement obstacles should be addressed and it should be overcome in the national arbitration law with some new provisions. So I think, it, according to the authorities' opinion, the update, the update of the national law has been put to agenda of the National People's Congress, the legislature of China. So uh, I think the revision of national law uh, will be ready in the next two or three years. Thank you. Well, that's very encouraging uh, and good news uh, to hear. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, Julian or, or Tigran, did, did either of you have comments or, or questions for uh, Li Hu regarding his presentation? I, I suppose I have this question. I mean, I think the whole question of China as an arbitration center is fascinating. The pace of change is quite remarkable. Uh, I did my first arbitration in China, which was a Shanghai project under ICC rules that seat Singapore. 22 years ago. At that stage, it was very difficult to find uh, a lawyer who from, from the mainland who had significant arbitration experience. Um, and, and the growth of expertise within the mainland on arbitration has been quite extraordinary. Um, and the fact that we're now talking about whether it is likely to become a major seat is testament to that. Um, what I would be interested in against that background is to what extent if we see arbitration in China as uh, uh, with China as a seat, are we likely to see it either um, focusing on a, a handful of arbitration institutes? So that there was, for example, if you go back many years, CTAC was the exclusive um, provider of, of foreign related arbitrations for most business sectors. So are we likely to see it focusing on particular institutions or are we likely to, to see it uh, focusing on free areas like the, like the Shanghai uh, free trade zone? 
Um, but if we are going to see it, how we're going to, in what way we're going to see the institutions uh, and um, provinces um, adapting to it. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Actually, compared with arbitration in European countries, you know, uh, there is some difference between Chinese arbitration and arbitration in Europe, in European countries. The first, in my mind, the Chinese arbitration is more institutionalized in that some factions invest to tribunal in Western arbitrations or invested in the institution, arbitration institution in China. The second that the, in Chinese arbitration, the case administrator can serve as the tribunal secretary. The third is that in China, Chinese practice, we can combine arbitration with consolation. That means that in arbitration proceedings, arbitrator can serve as mediator to mediate the case. The last point is that in Chinese arbitration, more attention will be paid to documents and evidence than witnesses. So the difference between arbitration, Chinese arbitration, and arbitration in European countries. Thank you. Very good. So I think we have now uh, 15 minutes uh, remaining in which to address questions, any additional questions and answers from the floor. Uh, I've already covered the two questions that were posed to me. Uh, I see that we have one open question from uh, one of our audience members relating to online dispute resolution. Uh, let me just summarize the question and then perhaps I can invite uh, Li Hu and, and Julian uh, and Tigrin to, to offer any comments. So the, the question says, in China recently, online arbitration has developed very quickly uh, and uh, many cases have processed through remote uh, video hearing and special online arbitration rules have been issued. Last year, APEC launched an online dispute resolution mechanism or ODR. Uh, not limited to online transactional disputes, but also including traditional commercial disputes. So the question is, what role do you think online arbitration will play in the dispute resolution along the Belt and Road? Will this development change the current landscape of international arbitration? Uh, and I would add my own uh, uh, gloss here that I, I think the question is addressing more than just the issue of uh, video hearings or remote hearings, but uh, actually an online mechanism uh, through which the entire dispute can be resolved uh, through the online tool. To what extent uh, do we see that playing a role in Belt and Road disputes uh, in the coming years? Uh, Li Hu, can we go to you first for that question? Okay, thank you. That's a good question, especially you know, in, the in the situation with COVID-19 situation. So I uh, yes, uh, at CMAC and CTAC, we have initiated to review a relevant policy during the COVID, COVID, situa COVID, COVID situation and encourage online hearing. And we do consider to change the policy and it resumes the conventional conduct, conduction of the arbitration besides online policy, along with the control of COVID situation. But you know, in practice, we encourage the parties may agree with the proposal of the institutions to conduct our hearing online. But in practice, and many of the parties still have a concern about the online our hearing of the cases. So I know, you know, the statistics statistics from CTAC. So up to now, there are more than 40 cases where the parties accepted the remote administration. In most of the cases, the parties are unwilling to choose or accept the remote arbitration. So actually, you know, both CMAC and CTAC, we have introduced online arbitration rules. The appearance during COVID-19 situation will definitely encourage which 
greater digital, digitalization of our procedure. So, in my mind, the conventional conduction of the arbitration and the online arbitration will go in the meantime. But the online arbitration is a future direction we're developing toward. In mainland China, I know many, many national arbitration institutions has issued the relevant rules for online arbitration and developed the advanced online arbitration case system to manage online arbitration. But the question to a large degree depends on the parties, depends on parties of agreement. If the parties are willing to accept online arbitration, I'm afraid the arbitration is still be conducted offline. So that's my point. Anyway, online arbitration of each direction. Thank you. Uh, Julian or Tigran, did you have any further thoughts on that question? Gosh, I got, I got, you, one could have, I think, an entire seminar, interesting seminar on, on that question. Um, I, I, I would, uh, and I'm also going to pick up, if I may, I see that uh, my friend Robert Rhodes, who, who I assume is in the UK, uh, has asked a, a parallel question about virtual hearings, uh, and I might pick that up as well. Firstly, I think it is clear to me that whatever happens, we are going to see, see a shift in the landscape. Um, it has got to be a significant period of time now, I think, before people will be A, able to, and B, feel comfortable to travel uh, in the way that they used to travel. Um, whether that's another six months, another year, another 18 months, I two years, I don't know, but that we're going to have a significant period and a long enough period to start to shift people's expectations. Um, I had to decide back in March uh, an application to adjourn a hearing in Hong Kong because of COVID. And at that stage, I did adjourn it, but at that stage, the question was, whether we refixed the hearing um, for June or July. Now, if you are looking at adjourning a, a physical hearing for COVID, you're faced with the question of, well, when will it be possible to, to get together? Uh, and that is already, I think, changing the landscape. How much of it will change the landscape is, is the more interesting question. Firstly, if one's looking at virtual hearings, my experience is are they work well. But to quote um, an Australian federal court judge um, in an article, it is still like swimming through aspic, through clear jelly. It's not the same as, um, as uh, doing it in person, or at least on the common law style of arbitration hearings. I suspect if we are going to have long-term virtual hearings as whether it's the norm or at least a significant part of the norm, it will affect how hearings are structured. Um, firstly, I suspect it will mean longer hearings in the sense of numbers of days uh, and, uh, and, and broken up. I say that firstly, the general experience of people from all aspects of virtual hearings is for reasons that aren't terribly clear why they're just much more tiring. Secondly, um, secondly, tribunals need time if you've got tribunal three to discuss between themselves and that chemistry is not there, but you need to build in time for discussions between tribunal members, um, which with time zones and things may not always be possible at the end of the hearing day if 
if if someone is finishing a hearing at midnight their time uh, it's not necessarily the right time for the tribunal to then get together um, and so the hearings are likely to be longer in terms of number of days but shorter days I suspect and that may also point um, to, to more uh, I'm not sure bifurcated or preliminary issues is the right word but but hearings in tranches where, where particular issues are dealt with um, be an interesting question as to whether it prompts the speeding up of uh, the the trend towards more civilian style arbitrations where documents and, and less witness evidence is, is important. That will be an interesting one to watch. Um, a couple of other quick thoughts. Um, the first of those quick thoughts is there are significant issues, and this picks up Robert Rhodes's question, significant issues around um, witness, the integrity of the witness process in the common law style arbitration by, by virtual hearing. How do you prevent or at least try and make sure you prevent witnesses who are giving evidence virtually uh, having information fed to them um, when they're giving evidence. Um, one possibility that's been adopted is to try and have um, a, an independent person or someone from the opposing party's uh, law firm present in the room when that witness is giving evidence uh, as, an, uh, as a um, monitor. That can work quite well, but it's potentially expensive and difficult. Um, what happens if um, the opposing law firm doesn't have a representative in the location where the witness is giving evidence, for example? Um, it's relatively easy to do um, if you have some or often easy to do a visual sweep of the room with a camera a 360 degree sweep at the start of the, the, the session but that doesn't necessarily preclude um, someone coming in afterwards when they may be invisible um, and much more um, much more difficult even than that is how do you police things like electronic messaging this system that we're using has a facility for written um, text messages between participants, for example. Uh, how do you, uh, and if I send one um, to a message to, to someone privately, it doesn't show up. So how do you police that? And we are going to have difficulties on that. I think those are, are issues. I, there are no easy answers other than the fact we need to be aware of them. I think making sure that someone on oath at least confirms that they don't have access to to outside interference is important. Doing the sweep is, but there's still a big issue there. The other thing is that when you come to, whether it's online hearings, so that's virtual, um, you also need to worry about bandwidths. Uh, and a lot, of course, a lot along certain parts of the, the um, BRI region, bandwidths are not, not good, and that's going to be a problem. Um, the final thing is, are we going to see full online? Um, I think that's difficult from a common law perspective at one stage. And another stage, I'm not sure what it really means if one takes into account that at the moment most documents are, are exchanged by email or, or Dropbox or something like that. Uh, if one means a purely um, online tool, I have some scepticism as to whether we're at the stage where that will be, pick, be picked up for major BRI disputes. Um, firstly, the bandwidth problem. Secondly, what does it, I think people want disputes resolved typically by people they can see. Um, and thirdly, there is going to be a challenge to the whole international arbitration mindset, which is if you are just dealing with an online tool, um, which is faceless, how do you have confidence that that tool is not, um, it, it, it has integrity and, and gives you the same level of confidence that you're going to get a proper decision. Those issues are not 
insurmountable but i think they're ones we're going to face but and on what do you think because i think it is a really important area well thank you i agree with uh with all of your comments and um i think it may de depend in part on the, the the scale and nature of the dispute so there are there are there are, there are going i think to be some kinds of categories of disputes that may lend themselves better to online resolution than others. And in the kind of rarefied uh, world of high stakes disputes that uh, I tend to uh, spend a lot of my time in, my sense is that uh, the, you know, the online uh, dispute resolution mechanism is not going to be an adequate substitute for uh, in-person um, traditional arbitration proceedings. Uh, but I think there are many, many disputes, many smaller disputes um, for which it does make a lot of sense and, and particularly where the cost of the proceeding is um, a significant consideration. So uh, we have uh, just one minute remaining and there is one last open question that hasn't yet been answered, which is also related to online arbitration. I'll go ahead and pose it now for any quick sort of lightning round thoughts from any of our panelists, but the question asks whether, uh, whether it would be necessary to, to have a law or a pass a law or have some form, some kind of law reform in order to legitimize online arbitration, or is it enough to just have uh, online arbitration rules promulgated by the arbitration institutions? Um, my quick thought uh, based on experience in the United States and, and China, for example, would be that uh, it's not necessary to, ha to, to have a law uh, so long as uh, you have party agreement to participate in the online arbitration uh, and you have a, a set of rules promulgated by the institution, that should be sufficient. That's my, my, my quick view, but uh, I now let me turn it to, uh, to Li Hu first for any other quick thoughts on that question. Yes, I want to say briefly one point in the discussion of the American Chinese National Arbitration Law, the special team was, was created and the proposal was put forward to suggest that a separate chapter should be adopted in the revision of the Chinese National Arbitration Law which is concerned specifically about online arbitration. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. We'll, be, we'll look forward to seeing how that uh, progresses. Uh, any final thoughts from Tigran or Julian before we conclude? It is now, uh, we're now at the end of our time. If I had 45 seconds, I would say, I agree, Anton, with you, it's generally not necessary however the issues that we're going to face are going to be what you need to do in order to ensure enforcement recognition uh, and i can imagine that there may be certain jurisdictions where the, there needs to be some change of the law to recognize non processes giving rise to an enforceable award but generally i don't think it should be necessary Great, thank you. Uh, Li Hu, any final words as our moderator before we conclude? Well, so uh, I want to say very sorry about the inconvenience of the network of calls. So I thank all the speakers for your excellent presentation. I thank good questions from the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. That will conclude the, uh, the webinar. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.